today on Ask This Old House. The big thing is um, when it rains, a lot of times we'll get water in the basement and you can see uh, water actually runs right down the stones. This type of foundation is one of the oldest in the country. I'll show you how to maintain it. Did you know that oil-soaked rags can spontaneously combust? Well, I'll show you the proper way to dispose of them. In this room, we have this kind of this wavy plaster textured ceiling, and we don't know what to do. If we should cover it, try to scrape it. This texture ceiling is old and outdated. I will show you an easy way to update it. The key is to keep the coat stained and add multiple coats for nice and smooth finish. For projects around the house, Home Advisor helps find local pros to do the work. You can check ratings, read customer reviews, and book appointments with pros online at HomeAdvisor.com. HomeAdvisor is proud to support Ask This Old House. Hi there, I'm Kevin O'Connor and welcome back to Ask This Old House where we love getting your questions about anything around the house because we have got the experts to answer them, including questions from Shelby in New York. Hey Roger, hey, good Kev. to see you. Jen, good to see you too. Hi there. So Shelby in New York is writing us and she is thinking about bulbs and wants your guys' oh. opinion on those. Well, <laughs> she's a little off on timing Time on wise. this since yeah. it is the spring. Yeah. So you have, to, you have to plan, right? So the best time to plant bulbs is in the fall. Right. And when, you think, when you're thinking about that, you have to have a plan. You have to think color, height, and bloom times, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't want to put the 40 inchers and then have a 10, 10 inch one in back of it. So it's all about sequence uh, when you do your design. And then when you put them in the hole, you might want to put more than one at a time if you want more impact. That's right? what I love to do. Take a good group of four or five and plant them. And when they flower, it's like this big clump and no one knows they'd only been there for one year. Looks a, bit, a little bit more natural. No, you want natural. Take okay. a handful of bulbs, throw them in the flower bed. Wherever they land, that's where you plant them. I was really? taught that that's by a, a landscape really... architect. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yep. The throw method. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Shelby needs to be thinking about next season because she's missed the fall planting. Yes. Right. They go in in the fall and then you have to just think about all those and she could, And when she plans, she could look up like their heights and their bloom times and she could even, you could even sketch it on a little piece of paper, you know, here's my layout. And so when you go to do it, you have a plan because it's always good to have a plan. Have a plan. Have, have a, plan. a plan. Love to hear. Shelby will be happy to hear. Betsy? Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Good. Thank you so much for coming. All right. Well, thanks for having me. First of all, I love the neighborhood. All these old houses, I mean, aesthetically, you can't do much better. I do know they're hard to maintain, though. Yes, we love old houses. My husband and I both grew up in old houses, and um, that's what we were looking for in our first house, and we love the neighborhood. Great. What year is this house? It was built in 1860. Wow. So nice old house. Nice old house. Lots of charm. A lot of work. Great. And <laughs> you emailed me about a foundation problem, correct? I did. I did. Let me show you it. Great. So this is our basement. All right. um, we've been here about 15 years and um, we've done nothing to our basement at this point. Um, but as you can see, previous owners have. Um, we're at a point though where the mortar is starting to crumble. We get little piles of mortar along the floor. Right. And the big thing is um, when it rains, a lot of times we'll get water in the basement. And if you look around in here, you can see uh, water actually runs right down the stones. Right, yeah, I can kind of see the streaks. So what you have here is very typical. It's a field stone foundation, and these stones that are in the foundation literally come out of the floor here. Uh, once they dug them up, if they had a big one, you can see uh, big ones that are now nice and low. This is actually a great example. But that's how they start at the base of the foundation. They use the big stones. They start to get a little bit smaller as you climb up. That's just to ensure that they get a nice level area to use this brick, and then when the brick goes up, the sill will sit flat on top of that, and we'll get a level house. But just looking at the stone, everything looks great, fairly consistent. Is there a spot that's worse off than, say, another in the area? There is, right down here. It's pretty bad. Yeah, I can see mortar crumbling, a little bit of insulation. The spray foam. Yep. This is actually almost ready to go. It's going to be a great place to repoint. And when these stones were laid, believe it or not, they were actually dry laid. Really? Yeah. They would use a little bit just to balance a stone here and there. Really? But, yeah, but most of the stuff that you're looking at is kind of defensive. Back in the day, the builders had a great sense of what we call water management, was basically keeping the water away from the house. If you and I go outside, I can show you a couple tricks. That'd be great. All right, let's go. 
Oh, all right. So plants up against the house. Back when the house was built, I guarantee there was no plantings here. Their roots can act as a wick or a conduit right to the foundation. Now, this one is probably too close to the house and that may have an effect. This, this bush right here is actually far enough away that it doesn't concern me. I'm really worried about, say, a tree. So if someone planted a tree close to the house, that's got some powerful roots. It takes up space in the grade, which again would allow water a least path of resistance to carry it to the foundation. Okay. So um, other problems, the gutters on the house? We do, all the way okay. around. Oh yeah, great. So a couple things about the gutters. Um, you run the gutter all the way down, you, you hit a downspout with it, you have to make sure that you're dumping the water in a great area, which you guys are, I like that. Another thing you're doing that's great is you're dumping the water into a pipe, so that'll carry the water away from the house. What you have right here is a missing collar, and that's a problem because leaves get into that cavity, they'll eventually clog it up, the water will work its way back out, hit this area, and again, the first time we went down to the basement, so the bottom of the stairs, that's where we saw the damage, right? It's right on the other okay, side of so that. So correlation is everything. But as I move down and I take a little look here, this concrete apron, that's perfect. Every sloping away from the house, so the water's running away, that's what we love. But again, the second part of having good gutters is maintenance. So when I look at this one, right, what do I say? I know, it pops out all the time. It pops out all the time. So uh, this is actually a very easy fix. Just take a gutter screw and put these two back together. On this end, you do have the collar, which you can see what I mean when I was talking about how the leaves get down there. Yep. This is not gonna let that happen. And again, we're always using correlation, right? We have a water problem right here. Where's the damage, right? Yep. I can see the dry event right behind me, so I know we're in the same area that we yes. were when we were in the house. Often people see water in the basement and they think, wow, I gotta call a mason. It's not always the case. A lot of the times it's water management. That makes perfect sense. I'm gonna leave you with some homework, which is just gonna be to tighten up these gutters and go from there. What we do wanna do though is go back inside and fix the damage that's already occurred. Okay, sounds all right, great. Let's go. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna actually wet down all the existing masonry that we see, just to keep the dust down that we're about to create. I don't think we're gonna need any tools here. All right. <laughs> All right, let's start by pulling out the mortar. Don't worry if any of the small stones uh, fall out because we can put those back in. If the big ones fall out, we're gonna be concerned about that. We're gonna wanna get them right back in. When we have everything thoroughly cleaned out, we're gonna take a wet brush again and we're gonna get into all the nooks and crannies and get all the loose, dusty material off the stones. And that way when we do get to repointing, we can feel good about the mortar sticking to the stones. All right, now that we've done a good job cleaning out the old mortar, we're gonna mix the new stuff. This is what we call a type N. We're gonna use a type N, which is a little less strong than a type S. A lot of people wanna use the type S mortar because it's stronger. We wanna use the type N mortar because it's a little softer and it's gonna allow the field stone foundation to move a little bit. Okay, so we've now prepared our mix. The last thing I wanna do for the mix is add a bonding agent. And this is gonna help the mortar stick to the stone. Yep, and now just push it in. That's it. Now that you've got a bed joint down, see if you can fit a small stone in. Oh, very good, Betsy. You're a stone mason. <laughs> nice job. It's like job. working with a puzzle. Exactly. So just fill the mortar in around that. Great. So it doesn't necessarily need to be flush with the stones at not all? At, not at this point. What you're trying to do right now is just stuff the back of the stone so we make sure we have a full cavity. Got it. And then later we'll bring it out flush. And then just continue that entire process all the way across. No rhyme or reason to the stone. Random. Okay. 
Betsy, you might want to push that in with the, yeah, exactly that side. There you go. Yeah, great. Now we're going to do the finishing touch, which is just a wet brush, and all that's going to do is bring the aggregate out of the mortar for us to see. And always look under the stones because that's a spot where the mortar is going to drip. If you hit it with the brush, you'll knock it right up to the bottom side of a stone. Oh yeah. You see how you're taking the tool mark away? Yeah. With the brush, that's what we're trying to do as well. So that wasn't so hard. Not at all. And it looks fantastic. To be honest, the reason why we haven't touched it in 15 years is that it just seems so overwhelming to us and it really wasn't that bad at all. Right. So now that you have the technique, you can just go down the wall a couple feet at a time get all the way around, then you'll have it done. But the most important part, as discussed before, is just make sure those gutters are fixed, operating properly, and all the grade around the house has to be sloped away from the house. Other than that, you're going to be great. That sounds fantastic. Thanks right. so much. You got it, Betsy. Take care. Bye-bye. Mark, it's nice to see you put the tools in the homeowner's hands. She yeah. did a nice job. She was great. She was very enthusiastic and went right at it, as you yeah. saw. And as it turns out, it wasn't even so much about the masonry. It was mostly about the water management. Right. So I get a ton of calls all the time about, I have water in my basement. The first thing I think of is it's coming in. Let's stop it from coming in. Right. But people spend thousands of dollars on their mason. They patch up the foundation. The water makes its way through, and they still have the problem. Because they never address where the water's coming from. They never address where it's coming from. Well, I can't tell you how many people tell me, can we take the gutters off my house? I don't want to clean them. But they don't realize how important that gutter is for along the side of the house. But I did notice on that back corner by the bulkhead outside, you could see how the soil had really come down low. That all has to get built back up so it can pitch away from the house. Right. And then they call the landscaper. I yes. mean, that's really, water management's the first thing you think of when you're designing something. Right. Where is it going to go? So maybe bringing that grade back up and throwing in a perforated pipe? They did have the pipe in place already, but again, the grade is still too low. So if it's not one problem, it's another. Right. Right. And, and what about the foundation plantings, Jen? I mean, what are you thinking about in terms of species, or more importantly, location? Uh, location, they should definitely be at least three feet off the house, right? I would. There's a couple things to think about. We're always preaching the right plant and the right place. Here, I want you to have enough room to be able to walk between the house and the hedges or oh. the greens, whatever is there, so that you can get through, number one, do maintenance, but number two, get in there and let that foundation dry out. Really? Mother Nature hates a void. She'll keep it wet in there, and sooner or later, the rocks will pop. Right. Totally agree. All right. Well, let's hope we got the problem fixed. All right. Nice job. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Tommy, after all of our build -it projects, we're talking about uh, sort of properly disposing the rags we use, right? Yeah. This is a concern that you brought up more than once. It's very important that you dispose of the rags correctly because, believe it or not, any oil-based finish that you use, whether it's in mineral spirits, uh, teak oil, whatever, they can cause spontaneous combustion if you don't dispose of the material correctly. So literally the idea is that a pile of rags can just ignite automatically, which I've heard a million times, yeah, but has it ever actually happened? Uh, I can absolutely say that it came close on one of our jobs years ago when really? I was working for my dad, yeah. We are doing a teak library, and so now it was time for the finish, and we went through gallons of teak oil, not a problem, on all the cabinetry. And so we had spent the day uh, soaking the rags in teak oil and then rubbing them on the cabinets and then throwing the rags in a pile. Yeah. And then about 11 o'clock at night, my dad got a call from the homeowner and she says, you know, I smell something funny in the new library. Can you come up and take a look? And my dad goes, be right up. So we got in the truck, rode up there and opened the door, went inside and in the corner, the rags were smoldering, wow. getting ready to flash. Another couple of minutes, you think they would have gone up? Oh yeah, they would have definitely gone up. And what'd so you do with them? Took the rags out, put them in the driveway, huh. spread them all out, and then sprayed them down with a hose. So you are a believer. Well, what's yeah. actually going on? I don't well, quite get it. Well, it's actually a form of oxidation. So as the oil-based product dries, it generates heat, mm -hmm. and it disperses into the air. And so if you take that heat, and you capture it with more rags on top of one another, mm, now it's you're holding the heat in there, right. and it's really concentrating. It gets hot inside, and then it will flash and burn. 
Okay. So we've got a couple things that you always have us do when we're done using these oily rags. You know, the first one is you like to lay them out and just let them dry, yeah. spread out. Take them out and lay them down. I throw them over a ladder rung or I lay them on the floor, spread them out. I take them and put them out in the driveway when we're doing a big project. Yeah. Somewhere where it's not near a combustible material and I don't pile them up. So it's drying, which means it's still giving off heat, but yep. it's not concentrated because you spread right. them out. I mean, think of your finish that you're doing on your top. Yeah. Believe it or not, that oil-based top is actually giving heat off, right. but the air around it is keeping it cool so okay. it's not going to flash. Yep. All right. So also, before we leave the project, after we've taken all our rags, and before we throw them away, we'll throw them in a bucket of water, mm. push it down, let it get wet. Mm -hmm. And the next day, we'll throw them in the trash. Got it. And that's going to give us a proper right. disposal. And of course, in some places, we've got to make sure that we're actually throwing the rags out in the proper areas, but just check right. locally. You know, I remember seeing years ago, the painters that my dad had would take a paint can that was empty with oil-based paint and rags and stuff that would combust, they'd put it in an empty paint can, they'd put some water in the can, put the lid on it, mm. and not worrying about the spontaneous combustion. Good. All right, Tommy, good information. Thank you. Well, thanks again for coming out today. No problem, Dave. So we're just trying to update our house here. Um, and some of the few things we've done is we scraped the popcorn off of this ceiling kind of make it a little more modern, threw on a coat of paint. It looks to, really good. Thank I you. like the way you see it. Thank you very much. But in this room, we have this kind of this wavy plaster textured ceiling, and we don't know what to do. If we should cover it, try to scrape it. Gotcha. What I think happens here, someone grab like a plaster trowel and create this pattern, which was popular 30 to 40 years ago. But right now, people want to see like a flat looking ceiling. Uh, I don't think we can scrape that but I have an easier solution that we can flatten the ceiling out and it's gonna look really good. Excellent, that sounds great. All right, let's get the furniture out of here and we're starting to protect the walls, the floors. All right, let's get to it. Just put a little piece of tape in there for now for security. Just go very close to the ceiling, okay? Okay. I want to make sure the ceiling is clean before we do any work on it. Okay, looking at the ceiling, instead of we scrape this whole thing down, we're going to fill out all the lower spots first, and what we're going to use is this fast setting compound. It takes 45 minutes until it dries. Regular junk compound takes forever to dry. So we need to use the 45, which will give us a nice and smooth finish, ready for priming paint. Sounds good. Are you ready? Let's do it. Well, this should look good. Let's start the mixing. Okay. Whoa. So I got my drill with the mixer. Start the mixing. We go nice and easy. We always can add a little bit more. Can you even add some? Yeah, you can add a little bit more of the compound. All right, put some in for you. Yeah, let's keep going. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. All right, let's see how we go. So what consistency are we looking for? Well, we do not want too thin and we do not want too thick. Uh, we want the right consistency because if it's too thin, it's going to run all over the place. We don't want that. If you want it too thick, we're not going to be able to spread this nice and smooth on this seat. All right, I think we're there. Let's get the trowel and get this work started. Uh, we got the hog with some mud here. And this is what we call taping knife. Are we going to start with that? And this going to go just like that. Get some on your knife, get it to the, uh, the edge of the ceiling, and spread nice and smooth. The key is to keep the coat stained, 
and add multiple coats for nice and smooth finish. good enough yeah try to get some of that just put that in a 45 angle don't worry about that yeah that's good all right yeah yes. don't press it too hard oh, we're gonna do more than one pass all right okay all we need to fill up is the lower parts first just goes like this okay sometimes people wants to get the job fast and they put on too thick Couple of things are gonna happen. It's gonna take forever to dry, and they never can get a smooth ceiling. Just a little bit of water. Go right here with a knife, and you can get that corner nice and clean. Yeah. Well, Dave, we wait about 45 minutes. It looks pretty dry. It's time to apply the second coat. And then we're gonna use a different trowel now. This is like gonna give us a nice finish and a smoother finish. Oh, perfect. Ready to go? All right, here's what I'm going to do. I wanted to put a little bit at the end of the trowel okay. and go over the edge, just like that. All right. The go for the second coat is to hit all the imperfections that we couldn't do on the first coat. Okay. Right, this is why we're getting this wide strokes. Right. All doing over there. Mm -hmm. It looks pretty good. Well, second coat is up. What do you think? This is amazing. I, it's so different than when we started this morning. I'm really impressed. Well, this is all we can do for today. Uh, what I want you to do is wait about 24 hours, get a 220 grit sand paper, lightly sand. There's a cup spot. I still see some scratch on the ceiling. It no matter how much we work with the knife, we're always gonna see a thing here and there. Uh, and then my suggestion is getting a white flat ceiling paint, couple coats and you're done. Perfect. That sounds great. Sounds good. Really appreciate it. This Thanks is amazing work. Thank you. Thanks for watching. This old house has got a video for just about every home improvement project, so be sure to check out the others. And if you like what you see, click on the subscribe button. Make sure that you get our newest videos right in your feed.